So I want to finish our discussion on the resistance to industrialization in philosophy and in building uh, by looking at, at a synthesis that happens in the late 19th and early 20th century in Germany. Uh, and it will have a familiar protagonist, uh, but one that we don't often think of as coming out of a resistance to industrialization. We often think of it uh, as, as an outgrowth. Um, I want to make the case that these uh, ways of thinking about uh, industrialization critically uh, have actually led to sort of three responses, right? One, the rejection of industrialization, right? The resistance to it uh, based on uh, moral or ethical, ontological or aesthetic grounds. Um, the exact opposite of that would just be a sort of capitulation, like a, 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 a sort of cheerleading for it and, and going ahead full throttle, which is what we've sort of seen up until this point. And I want to argue for a middle ground, one that proceeds with the efficiencies and the, the um, uh, effective uh, elements of industry, iron, steel, glass, et cetera, uh, but with a critical eye. In other words, thinking about it uh, with a, a, a thoughtful sense, uh, one that isn't necessarily uh, a full endorsement, but trying to think about uh, what's changed, what we lose, uh, what we gain, how our values might, uh, might shift and whether that's, that's good or bad. And to do that, I want to look at the history of arts and crafts in Germany, which we normally don't immediately think of, but I, I want to talk about an outgrowth of the arts and crafts movement that eventually leads to something that today we sort of take for granted as an element uh, in, in modern, uh, modern design and modern construction. Um, you might remember that uh, I mentioned Gottfried Semper when we were talking about the ontological critique and his visit to the Crystal Palace in 1851, where he sees this Caribbean hut uh, and, and is inspired to, uh, to complete the, the four elements of architecture. Well, he saw other things as well. Remember the Crystal Palace was an exhibition that brought in industry from all over the world as a sort of showing the state of the art uh, in, in many, many countries. And Semper uh, was uh, both impressed by what he saw, but also worried because he thought that uh, Germany's output was much, much less refined, much cruder than what he saw uh, on display from other countries, including America. Uh, he published a, a, a argumentative text style in industrial and structural arts or practical aesthetics, which is a great, uh, great title, I think. Um, and the gist of it was that Germany had some, some catching up to do. Um, it took a while, about a generation later, uh, but uh, a gentleman by the name of Herman Mutasius was sent to England in 1896 to learn what he could about the state of the art in both architecture and design. In other words, uh, to, to try to get ideas for how Germany might be able to catch up in the quality uh, of its industrial design and, and, and its architecture. He spent eight years there uh, and he wrote, he returned in 1904 uh, arguing that Britain's, the, the reason that Britain was ahead of the game, not only in terms of the sort of quantity of industry that they'd produced, but in the quality of the goods they were producing, um, was that they were able to balance craftsmanship and economy. And you could argue that the, the arts and crafts, the, the resistance put up by Ruskin, by Pugin, by Morris, um, had an effect on the way that uh, producers put their products out or design their products, that the, the, uh, the importance of quality, the importance of craft spread from the, the handicrafts that, that those folks were arguing for into British industry uh, itself. Um, Germany was undergoing massive political shifts at the time. Uh, in 1890, Bismarck resigns. This is the, the uh, sort of transformation of the German Empire into a, into a republic. Um, and part of that is a conscientious attempt to reform the way that, that Germany produces things uh, industrially. There is a, a sort of um, semi-governmental organization set up in 1907 called the Deutsche Werkbund, which is designed explicitly to integrate arts, crafts, and industrial production, right? To try to find alliances between people who are thinking similar things as Morris and, and Ruskin and, uh, and, uh, and, and Pugin, and those who actually controlled the factories, who owned the factories and, and the, the, the way that things were actually produced. One of the most important characters in all this was uh, Peter Behrens, who had been a sort of arts and crafts designer. Uh, he designed what was called the Jugendstil style, which was sort of 
uh, a German version of, of Art Nouveau. He was a founding member of the Deutsche Werkbund and also appointed as the chief designer and architect for AEG, which was the German uh, electrical concern. So the equivalent in Germany of, of say, the Edison Company uh, in, in the United States. And he wrote later that this was a confrontation, that, that the AEG was even then a very large conglomerate. And here's this very sensitive designer who's, who's been working in this uh, so-called empathic or very human-scaled style. And he's faced suddenly with the brute fact, he says, of industrial power, right? Just what a company that size is, is capable of doing. Um, Behrens has an idea about what he calls the will to form, where he, he thinks that there are ideal forms that humans impose on things and that it's the, the craftsman's job to sort of catch up to that. Um, and this begins a, a debate about um, what we might call typology or the idea that there are kind of inherent truths in materials and in function uh, versus what Behrens thinks, which is that it is uh, a, a kind of individual uh, uh, power and that the individual creativity uh, is more important, right? That, that the materials and the function are sort of subservient in some ways uh, to what the, the designer uh, imposes on it. He ran an architectural office um, that was a, 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 an incredible uh, sort of breeding ground for the, the early generation of what we think of as modern architects. So Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, and Le Corbusier all worked in Peter Barron's office uh, at, at one time or another. So profoundly influential, but with this kind of mix of ideas about what the designer's role was. Is the designer's role, uh, as Semper believed, to kind of coax truths out of material to find authenticity uh, in what was handed to them, or in Barron's case, is design an extension of the individual will, right? This, um, this will to form that, that Barron's is interested in. Uh, Barron's does, Barron's firm does the industrial design and the graphic design and the architecture for AEG. So there is what comes to be called a Gestalt Kunstwerk, which means a sort of total work of art. This is kind of the German version of Louis Sullivan's organic architecture, that everything stems from first principles uh, and that there's a consistency throughout all of AEG's production uh, that, that Barron's is sort of in charge of. So here you can see electric kettles that AEG produced in an advertisement that Barron's designed. Barron's also designs the kettles. On the right, uh, an advertisement for AEG's electric light bulbs. We talked about the importance uh, of electric lighting. These are early carbon filament bulbs, but they're still an important piece uh, of uh, office life, increasingly of home life and industrial production. And Barron's also designed architecture. So this is uh, a turbine factory in Berlin that is still there that becomes this sort of iconic piece of somewhere between architectural design and, and industrial design. And Barron's is criticized mostly later, for the fact that there is this kind of latent classicism in, in his buildings, that they aren't necessarily just the, the true expression of the function or the true expression of brick, but that there is a kind of latent, there's a sort of hidden temple front, if you will, uh, in this. And, and that is an example, I think, of what Barons would have called will to form, that he's handed a program, he has a set of materials, uh, but, but he's in charge, the designer is in charge, and there are certain things that the designer is going to impose on whatever, whatever they're handed. Remember, Emerson talks about the architect's role being limited, right? Once the problem is solved, uh, the architect just has a little bit of space left to work in. And I think what we're seeing here is an argument about kind of where that line gets drawn, right? Do we uh, adhere just perfectly tightly to the quote unquote facts of the case? Uh, or do we have ideas that we, that we impose uh, onto the materials and the, the, the functional problems that, that we're given? Um, Walter Gropius, uh, after leaving Barron's office, goes on to form his own very successful practice. And he too designs factory buildings, but for other companies. And you can see in Gropius's work, again, this sort of balance between uh, wanting to be true to the facts of the case, what is an authentic factory, what is a, a kind of pure factory, um, and at the same time, like, what is the, the human role, the human designer's role in this? And Gropius has a very different aesthetic than Barron's. So when Barron's designs a corner, it's this kind of heavy, 
brick, you know, massive, monumental, structural, uh, very, very classical in a way. When Gropius designs a corner, his tendency is to express the glass wall and to show that the, the, the floor slabs and the roof above are being cantilevered right there of concrete, which we'll talk about in the next uh, lecture. Um, Gropius feels like there is authenticity mostly in the modern materials and in the, the, the industrial functions that he's been given. So a very different take. And you can think of this as sort of the idea of, of Semper looking at the elemental pieces of architecture. It's just now instead of ceramics and uh, woven reeds and wood, Gropius is working with steel and concrete and glass. What are the elements of architecture that's made with industrial materials? Again, not a rejection of industry, but a critical look at what the products of industry are and how we might be able to find uh, meaning in them, how we might be able to find uh, you know, inherent good, how we might be able to use these for uh, a more equitable uh, workplace, et cetera, et cetera. In 1914, just at the outbreak of World War I, the Deutsche Werkbund has an exhibition in Cologne where, among other things, Gropius designs this model factory. And in it, you can see this battle between trying to um, uh, uh, relate using uh, reasonably historic forms, albeit abstracted. So the factory here is symmetrical. It's proportioned like a, a classical monument. Um, there's a little bit of Frank Lloyd Wright in it that, that Gropius is uh, clearly borrowing from. Um, but also you can see that he's using new materials as well, that he's celebrating the staircases that give access to the upper floors with these big glass volumes, um, celebrating the fact that there is new glass technology, that glass is newly affordable. And I think you can draw a, a, a vague parallel here to the Richardson Library, right? That the stair is expressed in the Richardson Library. It's an important piece of the program. It's covered in Romanesque ornament, but it has to be covered in something, and glass is expensive when Richardson is designing. Here, the economics have changed, the available materials have changed. In plan, that stair is a very similar uh, exterior form anyway, but it's rendered in materials that are newly authentic, newly available, and Gropius is trying to find his way toward kind of uh, meaning or authenticity in that. Um, the Deutsche Werkbund uh, is also known for uh, some very speculative projects, and the glass pavilion that we talked about a couple lectures ago shows up in this as Bruno Tallet's version of what an authentic glass architecture would be, how you would use this material uh, to define a, a, a new constructive type. So there are these questions being asked, right? What happens to our traditions? What happens to our values when the way that we build changes dramatically? And instead of just simply accepting something like the Crystal Palace, an idea uh, that is just multiplied endlessly, according to Ruskin, right? Just like algebra and industry. Um, what happens if you look at that and try to find meaning within that? I think that's the, the lesson of the, of the Deutsche Werkbund. This brings us to the Bauhaus, which we think of as uh, you know, the most important industrial design movement in Europe anyway in the, in the 20th century. And I want to argue that this comes out of this discussion that starts in the arts and crafts, that starts with Morris and Ruskin asking whether industrially produced uh, goods, materials, buildings, can ever have the same sort of meaning that handcrafted buildings can. And while the folks that we looked at in the previous parts of this lecture said, no, absolutely not, and handicraft is going to be one of the places we resist industry, Gropius and the, the circle of thinkers around the Bauhaus instead want to actually find those values, that morality, that, uh, that, that, that justice, that uh, um, uh, the, the, the authenticity, the beauty, in this new palette of materials that they have to work with. The attempts to um, reform our art and design education in Germany date back to this era of trying desperately to catch up with the rest of the world uh, in industrial production. Um, Henry van der Velde, a Belgian uh, designer, um, leads a small arts and crafts school in Weimar in Germany beginning in 1906. He does this successfully, but when World War I breaks out, um, van de Velde has to leave. He's Belgian. Belgium is at war with uh, Germany, and van de Velde uh, basically is, um, is kicked out. 
the struggle for who is going to then lead the Bauhaus um, leads to this discussion about whether design is a fine art or an applied art. In other words, whether it is, as Behrens would say, the designer imposing a form onto the materials and, and functions that they get, or whether it is uh, a designer working almost as a kind of uh, practical scientist, right? Taking the materials that they have, matching them to the problems that they're there to solve and, and trying to find new solutions uh, and new ways of beauty uh, within that. Um, after World War I, the school is uh, reformed. Walter Gropius is appointed uh, as chair based in large part on his uh, reputation for things that he's done with the Deutsche Werkbund. And very quickly, they uh, issue a, a proclamation that says, no, 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 we are not artists. Um, we are uh, integrating art and craft, that we're interested in taking what we know about art, applying it to this world of, of new materials uh, that we have. There is still a sort of battle between uh, those in the, the school who uh, believe in this will to form, believe more in the fine arts end of things. Gropius and uh, Theo van Dosberg, on the other hand, uh, are opposed to this. They want the designer to come out of uh, a more kind of scientific uh, basis. And uh, this leads to a split in 1923. The, the, uh, the artists are basically shoved out uh, and there's a move toward what Gropius calls a new objectivity. Uh, in other words, treating design as a, as a sort of scientific endeavor. Um, and they leave uh, Weimar eventually in 1926 and move to uh, Dessau where, where Gropius can build a new school uh, and a new curriculum. Um, this is the original Bauhaus uh, in Weimar and they have recreated uh, Gropius's office, and you can see that it is full of uh, both furniture, textiles, uh, and uh, electric equipment um, that is designed to kind of explore whatever the new materials uh, that were coming online were. So the lighting there, those are early fluorescent uh, tubes that Gropius uh, strung up in his office in a kind of geometric arrangement that is built off the size of the tubes, but as you can see, has a kind of compositional uh, intent. Here is that office. You can see it is a Gestalt Kunstwerk or, or an organic piece of design where everything down to the kind of letter trays on the desk is designed in concert with everything else. So taking uh, the materials, trying to abstract from them principles, proportions, dimensions, and then using those as a system to, to design the entire, uh, the entire space. All of this is based on new aesthetic principles. Gropius believes that we throw out um, all of the, the sort of formulaic design that went into neoclassicism or even the neo-Gothic, and we try to invent new aesthetics based on what the materials uh, are telling us. Um, early attempts at architecture are sort of mixed. Uh, the Bauhaus builds uh, an effort at, uh, at, at low-cost housing uh, in, uh, in Weimar. And as you can see, there is no uh, historic ornament. This is just the kind of pure construction materials uh, stucco on frame, not, not as it looks like maybe concrete um, and glass. And you can see the kind of struggle here, right? That is certainly um, an approach. It's certainly a, a, a rational uh, method of construction. Uh, it is not quite beautiful yet. And, and the, the Bauhaus designers are sort of struggling in this case to figure out what to do uh, with, with modern materials. One of the places they figure this out, of course, is in the new school uh, at Dessau, which, uh, which Gropius designs. And it is both functionalist in that the layout is based very strictly on this division between the classrooms, the offices, and or the classrooms and studios, the offices, and on the right, uh, the dormitory for students. But it is also um, very interested in exposing what the materials uh, that go into it are. So this uh, giant uh, glass wall on the left, for instance, is designed to express the, the nature of glass and also the cantilevering capacity of, of concrete, which is what the floors are made out of, very much like the, the factory that we looked at uh, formerly. And then all of the furniture, all of the furnishings are designed in-house. So it is both uh, a, a kind of total organic work of design in that everything is thought about in relationship to everything else. Everything comes from first principles about materials and function. Uh, and at the same time, there is a thought about how it is made, who makes it, 
um, who we can commission to do the glass and the lights, for instance, or who we can talk to to bend the metal uh, for the for the for the um, stools frames. And the Bauhaus has this legacy of very thoughtful, what we think of today as modern design. I would say that, that instead of modern, we might want to call it industrial arts and crafts. That, that this is a group of people who take the criticism seriously from the previous century. Um, take Morris in particular uh, at his word, take Sullivan at his word, take um, Semper at his word, that simply being able to optimize, to make things cheaply uh, and efficiently is not enough. And that we still need to, to make things, whether that's a lamp or a chair uh, or a building, we still need to make things that have value, that have meaning, uh, that honor the people who have made them, in this case, factory workers maybe, instead of, uh, instead of craftsmen. Um, and that, that are done with it with a kind of higher spiritual purpose, right? That also have a, a, a moral element. And the Bauhaus, I think, combines all of these with a, a remaining kind of optimism about the potential for industrialization, that it's not necessarily that industrialization is bad, it's that industry leverages whatever values we put into it. And if you are thoughtful about how those levers, how those tools can be made to work, you can produce works, in this case of industrial design, but also by extension architecture, that have the same salutary or, or good effects that the handcrafts that, for instance, Morris uh, puts so much faith in uh, can have as well. And so there is both a, a kind of, um, if not skepticism, at least a sort of critical take on industry but at the same time, a, a generally positive outlook, right? That it is actually, actually possible. So this resistance, right? This sort of initial generations that kind of dig in their heels and reject uh, industrial design, industrial building, um, coupled with the, the acknowledgement that if industry is inevitable, maybe we just need to learn how to, to, to better uh, apply its, its leverage. Um, this has a legacy that we will deal with for the rest of the class, right? That no longer are we just kind of uh, blindly following the best possible solution or the most optimal possible uh, solution, the most scientific solution. We're doing that with a, a, a vaguely critical eye, and that'll happen more or less as we look at uh, advances in the, in, the, in the coming lectures. It begins with this skepticism about optimization. Uh, and, and the way that I think we would phrase the question today is optimization of what and for whom. Who benefits from the most efficient solution? Are there hidden costs, unintended consequences? When we use that leverage to, to uh, meet the traditional problems that we have of shelter in particular, um, what happens? What, what do we upset? What, what do we have to look at in terms of uh, addressing or fixing? There's a very natural human resistance to massive change, especially massive technological change. And we have seen these four uh, areas, right? These, these uh, transcendentals, these philosophical ideas, where a lot of this arrière guard or rear guard um, uh, reaction uh, happens. And throughout the 19th and the 20th and the 21st century, we see this resistance come in, in various places, right? In a return to nature or a return to manual handcraft, in a return to cultural traditions, uh, or even into uh, fundamentals of materials and, and construction. Sometimes that's in traditional materials, but we also see uh, that, that resistance in modern materials, right? That we can find meaning in kind of digging in and, and thinking about materials as in a, in a sort of spiritual way or an aesthetic way, not just as in an optimization way. Two political trends come out of this. One is very conservative, right? And one is very radical. Um, we saw in the arts and crafts and in Morris that this resistance uh, inspired houses, not just in the suburbs, but in the countryside, owned by today would be millionaires or billionaires. But we also see coming out of the Bauhaus a legacy of socialist housing. So there are both cultural and political traditions that come out of this resistance that are uh, on the right and on the left. It's sort of politically uh, ecumenical. And I would argue that these four areas, right, uh, on ontology, ethics, morality, and aesthetics, 
Is it true? Is it right? Is it good? Is it beautiful? These are difficult questions to ask, but because of that, they are some of the most important questions. And whenever we find a reaction to advanced technology, we often find it in these four areas. We'll look at the end of the class at, at critics who mirror some of these ideas, uh, Walter Benjamin, Frederick Jameson, Kenneth Frampton, who continue this philosophical argument over whether industry is inherently good, whether it can be reformed, whether it can be approached critically, and they will very often find themselves in one of these four camps. I would argue that there's a need for balance, that we have to understand that the technology itself isn't good, evil, right, wrong, uh, true, fake, or, um, or beautiful, ugly. That it's, it's the fact that the technology amplifies these, that it accelerates um, or, or, um, or, or multiplies, leverages the values that go into it. And when we have uh, existing sociocultural, political, or economic conditions, um, the, the more we optimize, the, the more leverage our technology gives us, uh, the greater impact these will have, uh, for better or for worse. Ongoing debate, for sure. And this kind of critical um, uh, understanding or uh, this sort of reticence to, to plunge headlong into uh, optimization or industrialization is something that we'll see coloring the rest of the class, that we're no longer going to be just looking kind of uncritically at here's a new technology and here are the benefits that, that, that it brings building. We're also gonna be looking at those unintended consequences or um, what changes in terms of values, in terms of, uh, in terms of ethics, et cetera. Um, that marks a kind of good sort of half point uh, for the class. We're roughly halfway uh, through the semester. Um, and that I think is a, is, a, is a good place to point out that things change radically between the 19th and 20th century, and that this sort of uh, awareness or thoughtfulness or critical understanding is key to that.